Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India. Good evening, welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Uzma Jafri. Here are the top stories we are tracking for you on UNSC's Counter Terrorism Committee meets in Mumbai. India recounts 26 11 attacks. Pakistan's ex Premier Imran Khan kickstarts long march to demand snap polls. Regression in Afghan women and girls' rights is unprecedented, says UN official. And now for all the details. Foreign ministers from the United States and the United Kingdom and diplomats of the UN Security Council joined host India for a special counter-terrorism committee meeting in Mumbai on Friday. Indian Foreign Minister S. Jay Shankar reiterated the government's resolve to eliminating the menace of terrorism with stronger determination and joint action on the first day of the meeting. The two-day anti-terrorism meeting of the United Nations Security Council began in Mumbai on Friday with the Indian Foreign Minister S. J. Shankar and Ghana President Nana Akufo Addo paying tribute at the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel, one of the main targets of terrorists during the 2008 terror attacks. Jay Shankar said the gathering of the UNSC leaders at the memorial sent out a strong message on countering terrorism. He said terror will not weaken their commitment to fight back. India has been the victim of some major militant attacks over the past two decades, most linked to Islamists based in neighboring Pakistan. Terrorism may have plagued several regions of the world. We in India understand its cost more than others. But with that experience comes the stealing of national resolve. Decades of cross-border terror has not and will not weaken our commitment to fight back. Our real tribute to the victims will be to rededicate ourselves to combating and eliminating the menace of terrorism, and this by stronger determination and joint action. Key focus was laid on the rapid developments of three significant technologies used by terrorists, the internet and social media, terrorism financing and unmanned aerial systems during the meeting. UK Foreign Secretary James Cleverly said that the depriving militants of funds is the most effective tool to fight militancy. The second day of the meeting will be held in Delhi on Saturday. In news from Pakistan, Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan on Friday kick-started a massive long march rally towards capital Islamabad from Lahore city to pressure the government into calling snap polls. The ruling coalition has rejected the demand, saying polls will be held as scheduled later next year. Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan gathered hundreds of supporters in the eastern city of Lahore on Friday to join a caravan of cars and trucks heading for the capital Islamabad to pressure the government into calling snap polls. Since being ousted in April through a parliamentary vote, Khan has held rallies across Pakistan, stirring opposition against a government that is struggling to bring the economy out of the crisis that Khan's administration left it in. The Long March rally is expected to draw more support along its way before entering the capital by November 4. Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif's coalition government has rejected PTI's demand, saying that polls will be held as scheduled in October next year. The federal government, which runs Islamabad, has indicated that any deviation from approved protest plans will be met with force from the city's police. More on news from Pakistan. Pakistan's Interior Minister Rana Sanaullah has said PTI Chief Imran Khan and other party leaders 
will be investigated in the case of journalist Arshad Sharif's killing in Kenya. This comes after Imran Khan this week said the incident was a target killing but did not offer any evidence to support the claim. A day after opposition PTI leader Faisal Wadwa's claim that journalist Arshad Sharif's killing was pre-planned in Pakistan, Interior Minister Rana Sanullah on Thursday said PTI chief Imran Khan and other party leaders will also be investigated in the killing case. Former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan on Tuesday said the incident was a target killing but did not offer any evidence to support the claim. Sanaullah told reporters a narrative was built by Imran Khan that Arshad Sharif was being intimidated and threatened. And a hoax threat alert for the journalist was issued by the PTI-led government in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which would also be investigated. Arshad Sharif died on Sunday in Nairobi when police opened fire on a vehicle he was travelling in as it drove through a police roadblock without stopping, according to a Kenyan police report. The circumstances of the killing has sparked outrage in Pakistan. He was saying that he was making his statement that he was scared, he was scared, and he was forced to go out of the way. He was scared, he was scared. एक थ्रेट अलर्ट जो है वो जारी किया गया जारी किसने किया केपीके की गवर्नमेंट ने जारी किया मैं दावे से कहता हूं इस बात को हम थ्रू प्रॉपर इंक्वायरी जो है वो सामने ले आएंगे ऑन थर्सडे थाउजेंड्स ऑफ पीपल अटेंडेड द फ्यूनरल ऑफ जर्नलिस्ट अरशद शरीफ इन इस्लामाबाद द हाई प्रोफाइल जर्नलिस्ट शरीफ हैड रिसेंटली फ्लैट पाकिस्तान साइटिंग थ्रेट्स टू हिज लाइफ आफ्टर वर्किंग मेनी इयर्स एज अ प्राइम टाइम टेलीविजन न्यूज शो होस्ट The Kenya Union of Journalists has also cast doubt over the police version of events. Pakistan's Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif has also said he will set up a judicial commission to investigate. Meanwhile, Pakistan Army's media wing chief Bawar Iftikhar and spy agency ISI chief Lieutenant General Nadeem Ahmed Anjum in an unprecedented move told a news conference that Arshad Sharif had no threats to his life in Pakistan. The UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Afghanistan, Richard Bennett, this week told the UN General Assembly that severe restrictions and barriers have been put in place in Afghanistan intended to render women invisible in society. The Taliban in response has called Bennett's remarks contradictory to reality and baseless. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Afghanistan, Richard Bennett, has said that severe restrictions and barriers have been put in place in Afghanistan intended to render women invisible in society, a Just setback unprecedented in the country's history. Speaking during a press briefing in New York, Bennett said Afghanistan is the only country where girls are prohibited from attending school past the sixth grade. With restrictions on their freedom of movement and expression, most women no longer have access to employment opportunities and their civic and political roles have diminished and disappeared completely. He said that the country continues to face a human rights and humanitarian crisis. First of all is the uh, huge regression in the rights of women and girls. The reversal is probably unprecedented in history. Uh, it's in a way even greater than in 96 because of the gains that had been made over 20 years after the formation of the Republic in 2001. It's a huge setback. The Taliban spokesperson for the foreign ministry, however, in a statement called Bennett's report as contradictory to reality and added that he conveniently ignored improvements in human rights situation conveyed to him by Taliban officials in Kabul, Bamiya and Panjshir. Bennett's visit this month occurred shortly after the attack on the Kaj Education Center in Kabul that killed 54 female students, mostly from minority Hazara Shiite community. With only two reporters present at his press conference at the UN headquarters, Bennett criticized the media and the international community for being disheartened for not paying attention to the situation in Afghanistan. Moving on. Around 446 young Afghans were commissioned to the National Police Force after completing a training course in eastern Nangarhar province this week. 
An interior ministry official said more than 50,000 policemen have graduated from the country's 10 police training centers since the establishment of the Taliban-run caretaker government last August. A total of 446 young Afghans have been commissioned to the National Police Force after completing a training course in the eastern Nangarhar province. Commander of the training center, Kari Rehmatullah, said this week. During the six-week training course, the new policemen learned how to behave with the people, how and when to use weapons and how to enforce law and order in society, the official said, adding the newly graduated police personnel would be deployed in Nangarhar and neighbouring Lagman, Kunar and Nuristan provinces. More than 50,000 policemen have graduated from the country's 10 police training centres since the establishment of the Taliban-run government in August last year, Amin Jan Fatehullah, an Interior Ministry official, said. According to the Interior Ministry, another contingent of 438 police personnel graduated from a police training centre in the southern Helmand province a few days ago. The hardline Taliban is looking to transition away from an insurgent force but has used its widely feared and largely untrained fighters to implement law and order after the previous police force disbanded with the fall of the government. The Sri Lankan government said on Friday that it will discuss the country's debt restructuring with creditors including India, China and Japan during a meeting next Thursday. The IMF has set debt restructuring as a precondition for starting a loan program for the crisis-hit nation. The Sri Lankan government and its creditors will discuss the country's debt restructuring at length at their meeting next Thursday. The government said on Friday as the island nation struggles to tackle its worst economic crisis. Sri Lanka's creditors include India, China, Japan and some private bondholders. This came a day after the government's chief of staff, Sagla Ratnayak, met IMF residents for Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan government, led by President Ranil Vikrame Singhe, is expected to present its budget for 2023 to Parliament in mid-November, which is expected to include higher taxes and wider reforms of state enterprises in line with commitments made to the IMF. Sri Lanka reached a staff-level agreement with the IMF in late August for a 2.9 billion US dollars rescue package over four years. But its completion hinges on the assurances from Sri Lanka's creditors on debt restructuring. Sri Lanka is nearly bankrupt and has suspended repaying its 51 billion US dollars foreign debt, of which it must repay 28 billion dollars by 2027. The financial crisis was partly caused by the steep tax cuts in 2019, which together with the impact of the pandemic resulted in multiple ratings downgrades that locked it out of the international financial markets. Environmental experts have blamed untreated industrial effluents, sewage and low flow of natural water to be the major causes of pollution in the Yamuna River which flows through Indian capital New Delhi. A thick layer of toxic foam was witnessed on the surface of the river on Friday where devotees were seen bathing during the Hindu festival of Chhat Puja. Heavy dumping of industrial effluents and sewage and a low flow of natural water are the major causes of pollution in Yamuna, the main river which flows through the Indian capital New Delhi, an environmentalist said after layers of toxic foam was sighted on the surface of the river on Friday. The froth floating in Yamuna River has been making headlines over the past few years, making it a cause of concern for locals and environment activists. The dams and the barrages which are supplying water to Delhi have cut all the flows of water. So the biggest problem is that uh, there is no natural water flowing. Secondly, if there is no natural water flowing, then all the water which is coming to Yamna is the water, waste water of Delhi. Now the waste water of Delhi and Haryana, some parts bordering Delhi, uh, consists of two types of waste. One is sewage waste and one is industrial waste. So the white froth issue, which is now very popular because of the Chhat Puja, is happening because of the soap industry, deter detergent industry. Kapoor added with the retreating monsoon pollutant load starts to increase, which makes the frothing more evident during October and November. 
Despite the toxic foam, devotees in New Delhi on Friday were seen bathing in the polluted water as they marked the beginning of the Hindu festival of Chhat Puja, Sun God Festival. The polluted water of the Yamuna River contains toxic chemicals including ammonia and arsenic in high concentrations, apart from traces of heavy metals in it. Prolonged exposure to such level of polluted water can result in skin and stomach related ailments and even cancer in extreme cases. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now our viewers can watch the show on SouthAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash SAsianewsline and follow us on Twitter at SAsianewsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We will see you same time next week. Have a great weekend. Good night. Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India.